2 Peter chapter number 1. Second Peter chapter number one, verse number three. We started a series this morning, and Second Peter, we're going to try to go through these three chapters, 61 verses, and see what we can find here. It deals with many subjects, the reliability of God's word, the assurance of salvation, how to grow spiritually. Instructions about false teachers, revelations about the end time, and of course this morning we looked at what we call verse 1 and 2, precious faith, and we saw truth about it. So let's look at verse number 3 and read right on through into, through the 11th verse of first chapter. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust." And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's look tonight at what we're going to call spiritual growth. This may be, very well may be, the greatest paragraph in our Bible on the subject of spiritual growth. We do need to grow in our relationship with the Lord Jesus, don't we? Verse 5 says, And beside these, giving all diligence. Now listen to the growth idea. Add to your faith virtue. And then it's implied with the rest of it. Add to your virtue, knowledge, add to your knowledge, temperance, add to your temperance, patience, add to your patience, godliness, add to your godliness, brotherly kindness, add to your brotherly kindness, charity. And so there's stuff that needs to be added in our spiritual life. That word add is a Greek imperative. It is a verb. It is... The Greek imperative means that it is something that God commands and demands of us. We are to seek these things and add God's stuff to our faith. And then not only that, we're told in verse number 5 that it's to be an all-out effort. On our part. It says giving all diligence. Add to. And giving all diligence. Then verse 5, we, or verse, excuse me, verse 10, we find the same idea. It uses, repeats it. It says give diligence to it. Give it all you've got is the idea. Idea. 
So it's exactly the opposite of half-heartedness. It's exactly the opposite of laziness, spiritual laziness. The Lord said, give it y'all. That's a good message to hear. That's the right message to hear in our lackadaisical kind of hour, spiritually speaking. Be diligent. Be determined to grow in the things of God and in the ways of God. Be determined about it. Wonder, do we have any drive to become more with God? Do we have a, any desire to become more for God than we are, than we have been? We ought, we ought to have a drive, a diligence, a determination to grow spiritually. Now, look at these. The practices we're to progress in are given to us. Verse 5 through 7, a list of eight things are given to us. Now, imagine we're building a building. We're building a house. We're building a building. And we have a foundation and a floor and walls and a roof. And brick upon brick is being laid. And the first is foundational that we're given here. Everything else you build on is built on this. Verse Five. It says, add to your what? Faith. There's foundational. We looked at it this morning. We saw it in verse 1 and 2. The gift of faith, the group who have saving faith, the ground of faith, the gains of saving faith. So all who have been saved have this faith, confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ, confidence in the Word of God, trusting heart they have that in, in them. Because it went on to say, verse 1, them that have obtained like precious faith. To obtain means to come into possession of. I've come into possession. I've come to possess this confidence in my heart. And we mentioned that it is a gift of God. We mentioned that it will take a work of God and a work of the Word of God and the Spirit of God for you to ever get this faith. And we talked about it this morning. This trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So salvation is a gift. It's not earned. It's not worked for salvation is not you can't earn you can't do enough you can't give enough you can't all that kind of business but having said that spiritual growth requires diligence and you do have to work at it and that's where we're camping for tonight's message in this section Actually, if you're going to be half-hearted, just lackadaisical, then you can you just rest on it. You're not going to grow. You're just going to stay stumped. You're going to stay small, spiritually speaking, in your heart, in your soul. So you have to be diligent. We have to be diligent. Faith must be maintained. You will, if you say, you will always have genuine faith. Right? You will believe. You have this in you. But having said that, it is possible, the Bible talks about it. It talks in Matthew 16, 8 about little faith. It speaks in Romans 4.19 of weak faith. And then, of course, it speaks in Matthew 8.10 of great faith. So, we can be in any of those categories at any time. You say, well, I know I'm saved and I'm confident that Jesus Christ is the only Savior and that He forgave me of my sins back there and all this kind of business. But, if we don't watch out, 
we still, that faith will grow dim. It's not strong. It's not vibrant. It's not healthy. It's not strong faith. And so, it has to be maintained. Even this faith that God gives us at new birth and in conversion, and this work of God that takes place and you've got this faith in you, it has to be tended to. So, that's foundational. Do you have the foundation for growth? Genuine faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and His great promise. Promises. All right, look at the second. We're looking at practices we're to progress in. Secondly, add virtue it says and add to your faith virtue what's virtue it's moral excellence it's not moral mediocrity it is personal holiness it is purity of life and may I hasten to say that clean living always follows salvation you get genuine faith and the first thing that a child of God wants to do is just get stuff right in his or her life. When you get saved, there's, there's desire to start cleaning stuff up. Having said that, in a, in a generation that doesn't know right and wrong very well, you may still have a lot of ideas that are wrong. And you think they're all right. You get saved, and you say, well, how in the world? You know what? After they got saved, they didn't even tithe for six months. You th they're not saved. Well, they didn't ever hear about it. They don't know nothing about tithing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but they can't be saved. They can't be what do you mean they can't be saved? They're just going with whatever light they've got. And people don't know exactly what all's right and what's wrong. Some people have been raised in church and have a good moral foundation. No Ten Commandments and no moral rightness and wrongness and all of those kind of things. And we all of us have a conscience. But listen, there's people whose consciences are warped in our generation. In particular. So, we're living in a day that has removed this moral excellence that's described here. There was a day in our country whenever abortion was called murder. But now abortion is fully funded, promoted, and don't dare say anything about it. You might get fired over it. There was a day when homosexuality was an abomination before God and was against the law. Still might be on the books. But today, Florida governor is blasted because he has determined that, and it's not even that big a deal, but determined that those who are in third grade and below in Florida will not be taught about sexual matters. And they've tried to crucify him. Somebody a voting president. We need somebody just like him. There was a day when transgenderism was a psychosis. It was a mental disorder. You hear me? And yet, it is the push. Our president, the other day, made a big deal about Transgender Day. Is that what it was called? Somebody help me. 
and then go to won't go to the podium to talk about the southern border and other critical issues on the on the agenda but he'll come and make sure that he talks about transgenderism and what's even worse is you have the same thing in sports you have the NCAA, you have sports, and all these folks are just pushing it. They're just throwing it at us and saying, you'll get on board or you'll get run over one of the two. Somebody needs to add virtue. To faith. Used to be there was a day that you could not be living in sexual immorality and become a member of a church. You couldn't. It wasn't possible. And if you were living in sexual immorality and you were a member of a church, you'd get churched over it. You're no longer in the membership. You can't partake of the Lord's Supper anymore. Until, until there's real repentance and a change of course. Right? And yet, you know what? Where are we at today? Now, we have those who are living out of wedlock, sexual immorality, and they are now being promoted as ministers in major professed Christian denominations. And I am talking about groups that were previously at least, if not fundamental, they were at least evangelical. So I'd suggest tonight that we need to teach and exemplify virtue to a generation who doesn't know right from wrong. And I emphasize not only do we need to teach it, we need to exemplify it. What, what are you teaching others by your lifestyle, by your practices, by your living? Oh yeah. Mom, mom she's a, she's a bold-faced liar, but she's a good Christian. That's the kind of stuff. You know what I mean? I know they're, they're thieves, but you know they're good people. <clears throat> Sexual immorality, uh, no big deal. Everybody's doing it. No, young folks don't get married anymore. Everybody knows young folks don't get into that kind of a binding obligation kind of deal anymore. And so people live in sexual immorality and the, raising kids. Raising kids. And the kids, they have to see it. And they have to see. Leading them down. A, one of the tragedies of our day as well is that we're so stinky and selfish that it doesn't matter what it, how it's going to affect anybody else. There, it, I know I've got kids and I love my kids and I know my kids an eternal soul, but you know I got my life to live and I'm going to do what I want to do because I've. I, that's the kind of disposition we have. God have mercy on this generation. Moral living is important to God. Habitual. Immorality is a sign that a person's unsaved. No matter how much they confess that they're saved. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9, 10. Listen to this. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators or idolaters or adulterers or effeminate or abusers of themselves with mankind. That's homosexuals nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, etc., shall inherit the kingdom of God. They shall not. And it's habitual, it's the practice of life, it's their course of life. You say, but David committed adultery. Yes, he did. And God chastened the fire out of him for doing it. 
And then he deeply repented whenever God dealt with him. We have a generation that's trying to justify all this stuff. Well, I can go to heaven and do... No, I can escape hell and still live like this. You cannot! It's not possible. Habitual immoral living is a sign that a person is unsaved. It is. And a child of God is to be morally right in a morally wrong world. To be morally right, child of God helps you to grow. To be morally wrong hinders you from growth. Faith. Add to your faith virtue. Thirdly. And then add to your virtue knowledge. Are you growing in knowledge? God's knowledge. Verse 5, it's the word gnosis, knowledge. Then it's used in verse 2 and 3 as uh, uh, an intensive epignosis that is for, full, thorough, precise, correct knowledge. Knowledge, know, known. Those words, knowledge, know, known, are found 16 times in 2 Peter. Nine times in this first chapter. What, what's it, the, the book concludes in chapter 3. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're to grow. If you're growing, you're knowing. If you're not wanting to know, then you're not going to grow. Spiritually speaking, that means you have to read your Bible. That means, unless you're physically shut in or unable, God's design is for us to go to the house of God. And here, God called preachers and teachers... To explain and expound the Word of God. Just like we're doing tonight. We're, we're just walking through. And here it is. And it's very clear. It's what God says to us. You've got to have it. It's God's design. God didn't just say. It, 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 was, it wasn't just man saying. Okay. let's. How about let's put a building together. And call folk together on Sunday. And, and then have some preaching. And singing. It wasn't man's idea. It's God's revelation to us. It's what He desires for us. His will. You've got to get the Word of God. We've got to have it. We've got to learn it. We have to grow in the knowledge of God and God's ways. So, look, look at verse number 2 of the first chapter. 2, two through 4. The words knowledge, know, are there. Look at them. It says, uh, grace and peace be multiplied unto you. And then we mentioned how many, uh, the buku bunches of times through and by are found in this book. It tells us the means whereby you're going to grow. The means whereby we get fellowship with God. It says through the knowledge of God. And of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 3. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Everything you need to be a spiritual believer, a Christian. To be a spirit filled Christian. To be, to be what God designs for you and fulfilling the purposes of God for your life. Everything you need God's got for you. You're not going to get to heaven and say, Lord, well, I'm sorry you didn't have this for me. No, no, no. He's got the supply. There's abundant supply. And it says that he has given by divine power all things that pertain to life and godliness through. See what it says again? Through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. Through knowledge. Through knowledge. Twice already. Verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Where's that found? In the Word of God. God's given us great 
and precious promises. He's given us precious faith. He's given us precious promises. That by these, by, see the word? That by these ye might be partakers of divine nature. Well, I want to have, I want to have God's touch in my life. I want to have God's anointing in my life. I want to have good, close fellowship with God in my life. It will come by knowing and the knowledge of God through the knowledge of God. Through the Word of God. Through learning more about Him. Learning more precise epigenosis. Learning more precisely about Him. You knew something when you got saved. I preached on the righteousness of God this morning. Out of those first couple of verses. And you know what? Whenever I got saved, I didn't have the foggiest idea what the righteousness of God was. But I sure am happy that after I studied for a little while, I found out that God put righteousness, Jesus' righteousness on me, and I am positionally perfected in the sight of God. Right now, tonight. Man, you can grow. You can get it. You can increase. It can be added. God can add stuff to you. You can learn more about Him and His attributes and what He's like and His will and what He wants from you and what He wants you to do. We can grow. Look at verse 12. Somebody says, well, I already know all that stuff. I have heard that stuff. I've been saved for 79 years. <laughs> Only Brother Kurt would qualify. The, <laughs> I've been saved for a, a, a billion years. There's no such number. And what else are you going to teach me? Look at verse number 12. Peter says, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, <laughs> and be established in the present truth. You know what? You need to hear them again. God wants us to just keep hearing it. You said the gospel of Jesus Christ, doesn't it get old? Oh no, it gets fresh. Yeah, it might get a little stagnant. You might think, oh well, not so much, you know. And then you go to the house of God and the Sunday school teacher gets up with the word of God and starts talking about this grand and glorious sacrifice the Son of God made for you because He loved you. And then the next thing you know, all of a sudden you feel like getting up and taking a lap. Praise God. <laughs> You're happy. It thrills your soul. Accept it in Christ Jesus and because of Christ Jesus. The gospel, it's good news tonight. Amen. Yep. Add knowledge. God's knowledge builds your faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It instructs us in virtue and moral excellence. It transforms our lives. It will change us. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do we renew mind? By the word of God. Right? We never arrive. Oh, I'm a scholar. Well, just to, even the best are still substandard scholars. They've still got a lot to learn. Long ways to go before they're going to really grab a hold of just a thimble full of this eternal God. All right, where are we at? Number four. The practices were to progress in. Faith, virtue, knowledge. Add temperance. How about let's skip this one. Yeah. <clears throat> the word means strength within. And again, it says give all diligence to add temperance. That means... You're going to have to work to master your desires and your passions. 
And you're going to have to work to keep them under control. Right? Temperance. Once you get saved, you think, oh yeah, it's going to be smooth sailing. Well, somebody lied to you. Yeah. Because it's a rough road. Yeah. And you'll find that it's difficult. And you'll find that there are people that hate you because of it. The devil will see to it that there are people that will hate you for doing right. There will. They, they just they won't understand it. They don't get it. And so then maybe the only thing they know to do is lash out about it. That you have all of a sudden started doing this and aren't doing that. And you've put some standards and some principles in your life for decision making and and all. And it will require this, temperance, inner strength. It'll take self-control. It'll take disciplining yourself. It'll take self-restraint. It's like an athlete who will not do certain things because they're pursuing excellence and they're wanting to compete at a high level. Um, meth isn't even in the picture for them. Right? I would say that this temperance is in the list of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter number 5. So you need self-control, but it will require, require dependence on the Lord Jesus. It will require Holy Spirit enabling you should when you want it you ought to feed that desire and drive to want to obey God to please God to discipline your life but even at that you can't do it on your own it'll take the Holy Spirit to produce all of this in you do you ask God for help to grow in your actions, in your attitudes, in your restraints, in your reactions to things. You ask God to help you to grow in, in these matters of anger or maybe smart mouth or loss of temper, maybe overreacting. You don't ever overreact, do you? Miss Shirley's lit laughing back there. I like that. That means she does. I thought she was a saint. <laughs> mm. The Bible does say, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. He powers me, he enables me, gives me what I need. Listen, Paul is saying that because he's experienced it. So the question comes to us, have we experienced it? Do we know anything of self-control that you knew you couldn't do this? You couldn't tamp down. You couldn't restrain. You couldn't respond right in a given circumstance before, naturally speaking, you'd have said, just shut up and get out of here. No, 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 no. All of a sudden, you're able to totally and know something about long-suffering. And maybe you've been done wrong and it's no retaliation. Instead, it drives you to the Lord. You talk to Him about it and you say, all right, Lord, you're going to have to tend to this. I can't do all. And I don't want to have attitude. I want to do right. And that wouldn't even be a natural response. That's supernatural response. Temperance. Self-control. All right, next one, five. And add to your temperance. Let's skip this one too. Patience. Hupomone. To stay under or to remain under. What, what's it saying? 
it's going to require patience to stay right. The load gets heavy sometimes. And the work, there's so much to do. There's such a burden that we carry, Miss Judy, about unsaved folks who need to get right, who desperately need the Lord. And it seems like a Noah type day whenever you're not seeing people respond positively to the things of God and the Word of God and the Gospel like they have in previous years. And so the load's heavy. And you start saying, what's the use? And the devil crawls up on your shoulder and he'll whisper to you. And he'll say, why don't you just quit this stuff? And the load gets heavy. Doesn't it? Maybe it's suffering. There's suffering comes. Sometimes. And you have to be patient. You're going to have to again get help from the God of patience. To stay on track. In difficulties. To not get distracted. There's such a tendency for us to get distracted. And start going wrong directions. This patience is really endurance without complaint. That's not easy. Is it? Man, I've got at least got to complain about it. Maybe even to the Lord. Now, Lord, you know this ain't right. <laughs> and then about six months later, you see why it all unfolded like that. <laughs> and what God was doing that you didn't know about. Stay on track. Are you growing in patience? Brother Larry Cowick? Mmm, he said. Number six, add godliness. That godliness is just a manner of life that's well pleasing to God with an attitude of deep reverence and respect toward the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a devout, God centered life, is what it is, godliness. Number seven, add, I gotta, I gotta move fast. We're never gonna get through tonight. You're going to fall asleep before we get done. Add brotherly kindness. Brother Steve say, it's supposed to have been a series. What are you doing going through? Amen. Hey, man, Brother Steve, he'd have preached one, a message. He'd have taught a message on every one of them in Sunday school. A brother, and brotherly kindness uh, is the word Philadelphia. Brotherly kindness. Uh, brotherly affection. It, really, it is the, the wor same word for the womb being born out of the womb it is it, it is to love show love and kindness to those who are in the family of God that's a particular word that it's talking about and people that it's talking about you you need to love God's people God's people need to be loved and uh, we we need to show kindness we need to grow and be more gracious Bible says, "Let the law of God be law of kindness be in your heart." Sometimes you don't watch out. You think you're spiritual because you can get rough with somebody, huh? That's no mark of spirituality. Law of kindness: be gracious, less abrupt, be more long-suffering, and then add charity. It says. It's the agape word. It's this is this unconditional love. If you missed it, if you two weeks ago didn't hear Brother Steve or uh, teach on what love is, a whole lot of misconceptions about love and what love is in there. It's not just uh, mere sentimentalism. 
It's not just, oh, full-blown tolerance, I'll put up with anything. And that's almost the idea we've got nowadays. Oh, if you just put up with anything and everything and everybody, then you love people. No, 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 that's not what the Bible says. Take a look in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 where this agape love is talked about and the marks of what it is is given and then just ask yourself, do I really love people? <coughs> That'll be an assignment for you, okay? That'd be a good devotion this week. Just, just find yourself in 1 Corinthians 13 and go down through that list and start thinking, what about my heart? Do I really, am I growing in love? I would mention that uh, the greatest example of this agape love, which is used in John chapter 3, verse number 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loved sinners. God loved no-count sinners. Re those that were even rebellious against him. God loved them enough that he was willing to die for sinners. While we're yet sinners, Christ died for us, we're told. Romans chapter 5. I would say that love gives and forgives. What if God gave and forgave like you do? That's a big question. Are we growing? The practices were to progress in. All right. Final conclusion here. Look at the bad, good and bad results described in verse number 8 through 11. There's first given the result if you have these things. If you have these eight characteristics, if your faith and, and you, you, you've grown in these areas. We're told in verse number eight that you will be spiritually fruitful in the knowledge of God. In the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Look what it says, verse eight, read it. Let's read. For if these things be in you. Now here's the result. And abound. Oh, they're developing. They're getting bigger. They make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the epigenosis word. It's the word which means full knowledge, precise knowledge, assured knowledge, knowledge of truth, knowing. See, by growth comes growth in knowledge. Or we would, I would say insight. Why should God show me more and give me more understanding if I'm not even doing what I'm supposed to be doing with what I've got? Yeah. You'll be spiritually fruitful. And not only that, you'll be sure. Verse 10, look at it. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure for if you do these things, you shall never fall. In other words, if you're growing, then that will help produce fellowship with God. That will help produce sensed presence of God in your life. That will help you to have better confidence in the Word of God and the promises of God. And so as a result, it just seems natural. Man, my calling election, sure. I'm in the family. I know he called me. 
I know I'm one of His chosen. Make your call in election? Sure. <laughs> what? It, it comes with those that have these things here. That have these things. And then, of course, uh, verse 11. You will be rewarded in heaven. It says, therefore, so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There's going to be abundance. There is rewarding. What? For those who are growing. Those who spend their lives growing in the Lord. And in the ways of the Lord. There's going to be honoring. You say, well, yeah, I want a crown so I can strut around. No, no, that's not what heaven's about. You're going to get a crown so you can lay it at the nail-scarred feet of the Son of God and declare, I praise you, you did it all. Even the drive that I had, the diligence and desires that I had to do right, you the glory. It was your intervening, your powering. The result, if you have these things, those three results. And then the result, if you lack these things. In the list of eight, look at verse number nine. If you have these list of eight, then verse number nine. But he that lacketh these things, the list of eight, is what? blind it's a word which means to be enveloped with smoke Zodiati says so that you're unable to see clearly and verse 9 said that not only blind but cannot see afar off very short sighted we're told no, no sense of direction. Unable to see clearly. Why? Because they won't grow. You say, could a child of God get in that kind of condition? Yep. Yep. Sort of a cloud of confusion. Not clarity and certainty. Certainly the unsaved are there. Aren't they? Sure they are. Ever learning and ne never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Oh yeah. I figured it out. I put pieces of the puzzle together but still can't come to the truth. Romans 10 too. Seven, zeal for God without knowledge. See, you can be zealous. You can be religiously zealous. <laughs> there are, there's a whole, whole pile of them. There's a group that's more diligent in door knocking probably than anybody I know. And they think that they become God's. That's not truth. There's blindness. And then none of that short-sightedness. And then they have forgotten. They were purged from their old sins. You say, could a child of God get in such a mess? Yep. Saved, but not growing. Something happened. And they quit adding. They quit giving diligence. And they're not adding and they've become lukewarm and half-hearted and so what happens all of a sudden they're not waking up every day to bow the knee and say let me recollect about that night you got that you birthed me in the family of God that week that you brought me under conviction and troubled my heart and then the sweet release whenever I cried out to you and you forgave me no no they're not thinking about that stuff 
Something's happened to get them distracted, to get them off course. And they're not about growing spiritually. They're not about adding and adding and adding and adding and adding. Uh, God stuff. They're about adding and adding this and that and something else. All of it that's not God stuff. And so in some sense, it's all just in the back of their heart. In the back of their mind. Look at verse number 3 and 4. We've got to stop, don't we? Say amen right there. You know we do. Brother Steve said you should have stopped on that first point and just expanded the subpoints. The uh, Verse 3 and 4. Look at it. According as His divine power, God's divine power, hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. The spiritual life, right? Everything you need to be walk with God, to have fellowship with God, to do the will of God, it's been provided. Through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That by these you might be partaker of divine nature. What's it tell me? It tells me that you need power of God, from God, and you need the parchments of God, the Word of God. You need the Word of God and the Spirit of God to be able to grow. You've got to have foundation. Faith. Precious, this precious faith that we're talking about. And then you need to start adding virtue, moral excellence. You say, I'd never be a preacher because a preacher lives in a glass house. Let me tell you this. Every child of God lives in a glass house. Yeah. Everybody's looking you over every day at work, at school, wherever you're at. They're looking you over to see what you are. If they even going to believe just even this much that you really know what you're talking about or not. If you're a Christian or not. If you've ever really been saved or not. Looking you over. Looking you over. And you'll have to have the power of God and the Word of God every day of your life to be able to, in, to any degree, be what you ought to be. And what God wants you to be. Let's stay. Miss Brenda, how's your voice tonight? Stand up and sing just as I am right where you're at. Can you? No. Find, find it, Jennifer. You help her. Sing it if you know it. Everybody sing it if you know it.
some patience. Larry Cowan dismisses. <laughs> 